Hi there, this is Soft Critical Automaton. Welcome to episode 12 of my Let's Play of Bayonetta. I'm going to jump right in, but uh, while Bayonetta falls out of the sky, I am going to just explain that I am coming off of a whole week of really bad post-viral fatigue. I've been really, really ill. So I might not remember completely what I was talking about the last time, or I might uh, repeat some things, because it's been a little while and I can't be bothered to watch the whole video back to just see what I said last time. But yeah, so once again we see the game design paradigm of <clears throat> always turn around at the start of a level and see what the developers hid behind you. Or, you know, at the start of any new segment of a game. Let's see if I can grab this bird. Nope, it's flown away. I don't know how you catch that one. So, oh, uh, you might want to notice, you can actually see the previous level over there. If you look closely, you'll see it is the statue that was the centerpiece of the previous, the previous mission. So yeah, there's not much to do here, we're just going to head right in after I smash all of these everythings and get what juicy juicy items they drop. Also note the uh, ghosts of people. Well, they're not ghosts, but the people who are in the human world and therefore can only be seen as these shadows um, from... where am I? Purgatorio. These are the armed cops that we've seen a few times, and uh, they do actually react to you. If you start smashing stuff uh, or firing your guns, they get startled and run away because they can see that things are getting broken. And I think they can hear you as well. But um, I guess they go from being... Uh, uh, I guess they go from being armed cops to being alarmed cops. Nailed it. Okay. So, time to read in Antonio's ledger. Entering Vigrid. The ancient city of Vigrid is largely inaccessible, surrounded by mountains on one side and the sea to the other. While at first glance this may seem incredibly inconvenient, it is said that Vigrid flourished primarily due to the presence of strong spirit energy within the land underfoot. The Umbra Witches and Lumen Sages, each with respective control over dark and light, must have needed a land replete with this spirit energy to enable them to oversee history. There's still no explanation or concept of what overseeing history means, so I wonder if that'll ever be explained. The waves of time have modernised Vigrid, spurring rapid development. However, its residents still avoid outside contact, preferring to maintain their own culture and religious outlook. Their only link to the outside world is a single long-distance rail line. Simply riding this train requires an application to be submitted to Vigrid authorities, and a rigorous background check is required prior to the issuance of an entrance visa, which must be carried at all times. Once disembarking from the train, there is a further police search, after which one is granted admission to the city. It seems that what allows Vigrid the ability to be so strict regarding immigration is a seemingly close link between the Vigridian authorities and the Ithavol group, a conglomerate based in Vigrid. Yet, proving this link will require further investigation. So the word Ithavol sounded familiar to me, and I looked it up, and um, it's actually from the Eddas, the foundational texts of uh, uh, Nor Nordic paganism. And um, it's interesting because everything we've seen so far has been based on, you know, Christian and Jewish mythology. You know, those two having come from a, from well, Christianity having come from the Jewish tradition. So um, it's interesting that they're pulling in other mythic references at this point, and I wonder if that's going to become relevant at any other point. Um, but uh, the word itself, Ithavol, refers to the meeting place of the gods, where they where they gather for their, you know, discussions of the doings on Earth and whatever, you know, whatever the gods talk about, I guess. So, that is an interesting decision to include that all of a sudden. And it's also an interesting decision that I completely get hit a bunch of times, so I'm probably going to get silver on that one for damage. Maybe, maybe worse. Let's find out. Silver, haha! -ha. I'm actually a genius. So, yeah. Um, what was I talking about? The Ithaval group. I don't think I have anything more to say about that. I'll just be interested to see to what extent Nordic mythology is pulled in rather than just the um, Christian stuff that's been the inspiration so far. So, this is a pretty obvious puzzle. Once again, we have this interesting kind of design parameter in the game where strangely a great deal of the um how did she get here come on we are literally on top of a mountain in a very remote part of the country uh anyway so once again we see this curious design uh paradigm where there are puzzles that you might find in any kind of 
exploration-y, action-y game. I'm actually most reminded of Prince of Persia, and especially in this level for reasons that will become more clear in a minute, uh, or a few minutes, provided I remember to talk about them. But, um, yeah, it's kind of these incredibly easy, obvious puzzles where it's extremely clear what you need to do, and then they have made it, you know, outright explained to you what you need to do. And it's just curious that that's in a game which, you know, has combat, which is otherwise so kind of difficult for someone who's not game literate. And what I'm wondering is, are these puzzles only obvious to me because I'm extremely game literate? Would it be less obvious to someone who is less familiar with games that, you know, if you see a big arrow on the floor and you have a high speed ability, maybe you should zoom along that, you know, with your high speed ability. I mean, it's certainly easy to figure out, you know, there's three buttons on the floor. You touch the three buttons, you can't touch them fast enough. You yeah, need to go faster to touch all three to open the door, you know, makes sense. So, these guys are still really irritating to fight, but luckily I took the sword from the previous fight with me into this one, which let me get away with this bullshit, and uh, that is how you ace this fight. I don't think any of them hit me at all, uh, so with a bit of luck that would be perfect platinum. But, um... The Night Angels, the swords that they drop, do a huge amount of damage. Three hits from one of those is enough to kill one of these guys. Um, I think that the axes dropped by the beloved enemies are uh, do more damage, but, you know, they're a lot less common. Nice to see you again. Agramon, maybe? Was it? I can't remember. So that is the end of this one. There we go. I still really like that animation with the grasping hands. Yeah, perfect platinum. Or pure platinum. So, um, once again, I bet you can guess what we need to do for this puzzle. But first, I just want to point out that this actually... Uh, this level loops around and we'll go and be going back across that bridge a minute later. So, for now, I'm going to do this. And miss that for the first time ever in this playthrough. In fact, I haven't missed that since I first played this game two years ago. Highly embarrassing. Anyway, so I should probably talk about Bayonetta's visual design, which I think I was trying to do on a previous episode and didn't manage to finish talking about, but uh, in the episode after this, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff I want to say about Bayonetta's visual design and contrasted with certain other visual designs in the game. So, I don't recall if I did remember to start talking about this stuff, but um, both the way that Bayonetta is treated in the game world, or at least in the narrative, and the way that she is designed engender this kind of concept of like her untouchability. She's completely unflappable, she always knows what she's doing, she's unstoppable, indestructible, perfect, an absolute queen, etc, etc, etc. So, and of course the influences um, on that are runway fashion, which has influenced her um, physical shape, you know, her design as like a person. And uh, then extremely camp... Oh, notice that animation was misaligned as well. Extremely camp, um, you know, queer subplot just stuff, which, you know, makes sense because that's where camp comes from. Although I am curious about to what extent or of what form a camp tradition in Japan might take, because I don't actually know anything about that. And unfortunately, if you Google queer camp tradition Japan, almost everything you get is some um, articles about the Japanese internment camps in World War II. So, you know, it's kind of difficult to find, you know, a history of camp as, as a visual aesthetic in uh, the Japanese culture, because while a lot of this stuff looks extremely camp to me, possibly it's an entirely separate tradition, or something that stems from the same places but has different purposes. In which case, it's not actually kind of a queer thing at all, it's actually, you know, just a different cultural thing that I didn't recognise or pick up upon. So, uh, we're actually going to backtrack here. Yep, more backtracking. Fortunately, it's less irritating now that we have the panther form, because you can move a lot faster and jump way further, as you can see. So, all the way back over here for the only Alfheim portal in this level. Um, I think I'm probably only going to give myself one try at this, and I'm just going to explain why real quick. Basically, this one's frustrating. It's not difficult, 
but it has no margin for error and um, I know I can beat it but it might take me 10 to 15 tries to beat it and if I sit here trying over and over to beat that then even if I do eventually beat it I'll still have been tilted I know what I'm like as a person and I know that if I get all you know messed up trying to do this one I won't be able to be very entertaining for the rest of this video and I don't want to have to like go take a break and then finish recording it later so I'm just gonna give myself one attempt at this one and then you know post dialogue why I'm only doing one attempt why it's so difficult and so on uh I'd like to say thanks past me but she didn't actually hand off to me so I wonder if she's getting a little bit big for her breaches a little bit uh considering herself indispensable as if we're not a team as if we don't work together for this anyway this combat challenge is extremely frustrating for me personally because well, um, there's a few different reasons why. First off, you uh, need to get five torture attacks. That doesn't mean perform five torture attacks, that means successfully get kills with five torture attacks. If you attack someone who hasn't taken enough damage, then you are in fact going to fail that. It won't count. So there's only a finite number of enemies for you to generate, you know, magic power off of by doing combos on. So it's quite easy to accidentally kill too many of these enemies building your power before you can use the finisher. It's also um, quite easy to do that considering that if you get hit at all, you lose most of your magic power. So you're not only trying to avoid getting hit because of hit points, but if you get hit, then your you know built combo, combo energy that you need for the finisher attacks is just wasted and disappears. That's also very frustrating. The second phase has a bunch of these guys who have a lot of extremely hard to dodge and frankly frustrating attacks, which then ties into the previous thing that I just said about why it's difficult. So, um, yeah, essentially the main trouble with this one is that it requires absolutely perfect play. And even if you do manage to get enough successful kills with torture attacks, um, you then need to also finish killing the rest of the enemies regardless however you do that, which means that it's entirely possible to get enough torture attacks and then run out of time fighting the last few other guys. Uh, which I believe is how it ended when I was doing this in uh, my practice game. And we're back and I'm gonna leave. When I was doing my practice run through, I actually did manage to get very close to the end of this one. I only lost on time, but um, as you'll have just seen, I got nowhere near as far on this one. And since I'm not going to beat it anyway, I might as well. Well, I mean, since I'm not going to try and beat it in this context for that reason, you know, the one I mentioned, I'm just going to move on. Oh no. Okay. So yeah, um, Benetta's character design is incredibly sexualized. It's ridiculously over sexualized in a way that would be comical if it wasn't so unironic. It's um and I do think this game gains a lot from its lack of irony. Also this hallway is why I referenced Prince of Persia. This is you know again just very out of character to the kind of game this is in other respects. Most you know corridor combat games don't necessarily have these um trap sequences. So I guess I'll get back to talking about the character design in a minute, but first I have to read this, because I've committed to reading all of these to you. Aren't you lucky? Notes of the Topic of Magic, Part 4. Everyone carries within them a record of their evolution as a being since time immemorial. It is inner knowledge that the magical arts call upon when a practitioner uses the transformative technique known as the Beast Within. While there is very little documentation regarding this technique, it is comparatively easy to guess at its workings. It is even easier when one considers how many works of art depicting this condition fill museums to this very day. These works capture the very moment when a witch transforms herself into an animal. Present day interpretations never seem to escape the realm of dismissing these works as an artist daydreams. However, when viewed from a different perspective, they are an important reference point in researching the magical arts. These pictures illustrate the unbelievable transformation of an Umbra witch via the most special of means, seeing her take the form of various animals. The witches were able to freely use this technique, transforming into beasts for incredible speed, or birds to send themselves soaring into the sky. Okay, I have some questions about that, because what he seems to be saying is that because of our evolutionary history, we, or at the very least witches, who are, they made it clear before, are not a separate species, they're humans with more spiritual power, you know, anyone can learn to become a witch if they have the power. So what he's saying there is that humanity, at some point in, ev in our evolutionary history, 
were both animals, or specifically the panther, I guess, because, you know, that, and birds, which suggests a very different evolutionary history to our own evolutionary history on Earth, where we basically became small furry mammals and then apes. So I would love some further elaboration on that. What is the evolutionary history that takes us through... Uh, <laughs> through cats and into birds before we become apes and then humans. Also, I really hate this fight because, you know, I've said a thousand times how much I hate fighting these guys specifically because they're so fast and they can block and cancel out of so many of your attacks and, you know, they have these frustrating combos that they go over and over, forever and ever. And not only that, but this time, I get to fight two, and then another two. So even if I completely destroy the first lot, there's always the second pair. Fortunately I can torture attack this one. Haha. -ha. You know, I think she says Humphrey when she summons this as well. Which is just... Is it the same demon she's calling upon? Upon, you know, for the chainsaw and for that? My, give me something to dodge. Ah, okay, there we go. So Bayonetta's um, incredibly sexualized visual design is, to me, forgivable and doesn't feel like, you know, an example of the male gaze, simply because it grants her so much power. Um, also, I love that the, I just, I love that that animation keeps going. It just keeps wiggling. Uh, but yeah, she's untouchable and her sexuality is claimed under herself. She's not sexualized by other people. She is intentionally behaving in a sexual manner. Um, and that kind of redeems it and helps it escape the kind of, um, you know, unpleasantness of the male gaze and, <clears throat> you know, sexualization for uh, external or external sexualization, or any of these other like problematic components that you get in that kind of thing. And um, and the reason for that is simply that, you know, it's something that she's doing to herself, and it's something that grants her power, and something that encourages and increases her sense of untouchability and um, indestructibility. So, given all of that, some stuff that will happen in the next episode is interesting, and I will be talking about it then, but I wanted to make sure I had that point down really clearly first. Because, again, um, that is going to be really relevant next episode. And I do think that it does those things genuinely. I think that it does genuinely escape the male gaze, for the most part. I think that it does genuinely attempt to have a, a female protagonist who is, you know whose sexualization is her own thing, even though obviously she doesn't exist. She's a character who was designed primarily by men to look and behave in a certain way. However, so much of sexualization of female characters is done externally. Is something done to them or it's something they're not aware of? Whereas Bay I've met people who are like Bayonetta to some extent and that, I don't know, it gains a lot from that. So that is going to be all of this episode. There's a cutscene that I want to talk about that is on the other side of that door. But if I try and talk about it afterwards, then this episode will be too long. And if I, you know, have the cutscene now and the discussion later, that'd be a bit weird. So I'm just going to cut this episode here. And that's all from me for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.